Awesome. Thank you for uh, being with us this morning. I hope you have had a uh, great uh, Christmas. And uh, those that are with us here on, uh, here on campus and those that are online, just want to say uh, good morning to you and looking forward to worshiping together today. I hope you've come expecting. we got a great uh, um, thing to celebrate today. Um, Jesus changes everything, right? And we're going to celebrate that today through baptism here in just a moment and then communion at the end of the service. So this is going to be just an awesome day to gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, celebrate uh, what Jesus has done. And uh, couldn't uh, think of a better way uh, to do that uh, than to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, today. So if you're a part of the Green Hill family, thank you for being with us today. If you're not a part of the Green Hill family, you're just checking us out, whether here on campus or online. We'd love to know that um, so we know how to better serve you. You can go to uh, uh, our website, greenhillchurch.com, and there's a connect card there um, on, that, on uh, the website. And if you could fill that out for us and let us know that you checked out our service today, whether here on campus or online, we'd love to be able to reach out to you this week and just uh, um, know uh, how to serve you in a, in a better way. So if you could do that for us, we would uh, greatly appreciate it. I'm going to uh, pray for us here in just a second. When I'm done praying, uh, you can sit down and turn your attention uh, um, to uh, Pastor Darrell as we celebrate uh, baptism this morning. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you this morning just once again telling you how much that we need you and uh, how much that we're excited about um, making much of you today across this campus. And uh, as we uh, worship you this morning, we pray that you get the honor and the glory that you deserve as we celebrate baptism today. And we are reminded once again about how Jesus does change everything. I pray that you'll help the believers in the room this morning, that we will, uh, in our mind, think of the day that you uh, saved us and that we uh, obeyed uh, in uh, baptism. I pray for those in the room today that uh, don't know exactly what baptism means, that this will spur in them um, some curiosity to ask some questions about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, what it means to follow uh, in baptism. As we uh, listen to your word today, I pray that it will do its work in our lives and that we'll have uh, the courage to obey. And then as we experience communion this morning, I pray that you will, um, that uh, what you've done for us on the cross and the relationship that we now have uh, through your Holy Spirit will be fresh and new to us once again. We uh, thank you for this opportunity to worship. We thank you for this opportunity to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ and communion, community. I pray that you'll just give us a great day making much of you. In uh, Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Turn your attention to the baptistry. Folks back here, you've got a whole pew that you've packed out, Cooper. Would y'all just stand and let us say ha- hello and uh, good morning to you? There they are. That's awesome. <laughs> fan club. I got you a fan club. That's great. His dad's up here. But uh, Cooper's 18. You can be seated. That's cool. Um, Cooper's uh, in the Air Force, uh, just uh, getting started, and uh, but came to Christ several years ago, but never went public with his faith through baptism. And uh, we had just a great time earlier this week or late last week and uh, uh, just talking about his journey and all that God's doing in his life. And so for uh, like Casey mentioned, you know, baptism uh, doesn't save us. Uh, Jesus saves us. He's enough to save us. But uh, baptism is a way that we go public with our faith. It really is a, a really important, significant step of obedience that every follower of Jesus Christ. And I was praying here with them earlier and. Uh, For 2,000 years, um, folks have been following Jesus in believer's baptism. Uh, We stand on the shoulders of so many, and uh, we stand as an example for those that would come after us. Um, It's symbolic in that um, we're buried with Christ in baptism. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Uh, We're buried uh, and raised to new life. And so baptism is, uh, water baptism is a symbol of of what Christ has done in our lives. And so, uh, Cooper, grab right there. Let me grab there. You grab right there. How about that? Uh, Cooper, we're really proud of you and excited for all that God's doing in your life.
What's your profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Oh, that's awesome. Well, it's my privilege as your brother in Christ, as your pastor, to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.
die on a tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hands that you nations stretched out on a tree.
Christmas, uh, Sunday after Christmas, Sunday before New Year's Day, uh, we're kind of right in the middle, aren't we? So uh, welcome uh, to Green Hill Church, it really is good to see you. Let me just say a couple of words, uh, just take a little bit of a privilege. Some of you are online with us today, we're so glad that you're here with us, uh, some of you are in the room. Um, we uh, used A year ago, we didn't say that a lot, uh, we assumed that most folks that were connected to Green Hill Church, uh, would be in the room on a Sunday morning. This has been a difficult year. This has been a tough year. And I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for the privilege of serving uh, with you during this time. This is just, uh, we've used the word unprecedented a lot, and it's true, but these are just uh, uncharted territory, and you have been incredibly flexible You've been incredibly gracious. Uh, you've been incredibly uh, with us uh, through uh, a lot of, um, well, just a roller coaster kind of, of year. And so I just want to say thank you. It really is a privilege. We've seen God's faithfulness, uh, no question about that. We've seen his faithfulness in large part through you, through you uh, continuing to serve, continuing to, to uh invite folks, continuing to give and continuing to, to um, uh, show grace and kindness and live out your faith uh, wherever you happen to be. Some of you, some of us, all of us have uh, been through seasons of quarantine. We've been through seasons of, of uh, uh, working from home, not working from home, 
Uh, we've been online and offline and all the rest. And so I just want to say thank you and uh, congratulations, you know. Uh, we've survived. Uh, God has been good and we have uh, stayed at it. And so there is something, I know I said this a few weeks ago in another setting, but there is something about just staying at it that, uh, that the Lord honors. Uh, just staying faithful. Just keep walking, you know. Even when you don't know if it's the right thing to do, sometimes just acting is better than not doing anything at all. And um, so just your faithfulness and your perseverance, uh, I'm so grateful. Uh, there's a lot swirling around in our, in our nation today and certainly in our town as an explosion went off on Sunday morning in downtown Nashville. It's affected so many people in uh, profound ways, business owners and residents uh, that were directly affected, certainly uh, communication lines continuing to continue to be interrupted, but just another um, reminder of how broken we are. And no city is immune from sin and brokenness, no community is immune from it at all. And so through tornadoes and through COVID crisis, through straight line winds, through social um, and political upheaval, and uh, now through this explosion, uh, we have been called again to uh, trust God. Uh, we've been called again to return to Him. We've been called again to uh, know how vulnerable we are and how much in need of a Savior we are. And so I'm grateful, as Casey said earlier, that Jesus really is enough. He is sufficient. And uh, uh, He's uh, good for this life, but He is our Savior forever. And so uh, our feet are made of clay, and we, um, if, um, if we begin to think otherwise, we have, we have missed exactly what he has come to redeem. And so um, I just want to give a big shout out to the Lord who is faithful, and a big uh, thank you uh, to you as a church family for walking through all of this uh, with us so well. Uh, I also would just remind you that, um, and maybe I'll say it in a moment, I'm not sure, but... Um, there's still people that are here in the room, and there's people who are online. There's people who are your neighbors. Uh, the, the changing of the calendar isn't going to, you know, revolutionize anybody's life. Y'all know that by now. Like, I don't know if the, draw, the, ba the ball will drop in, New in Times Square this year. I, I don't know that that'll happen. But I'm just saying um, a calendar change doesn't change the world. And so I would just encourage you to continue to love your neighbors well. Uh, lean into who Jesus is in your life and let his life be pressed out through yours as you are sensitive and just showing each other uh, an extra measure of grace. Well, if you're turning your Bible to Luke chapter 2, um, I'm uh, in a section, this is still kind of in a Christmas theme, uh, rightly so, but uh, it's really coming in the hills of Christmas, just a few days after Jesus was born. He was presented in the temple, and uh, uh, to and a, and a man named Simeon met him that day. And so, um, I know you're just getting comfortable, but if you just stand with me in honor of God's word, we'll read this text together, and I'll pray, and then walk into this, which a text that I'm very uh, excited to share with you. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Uh, this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. Uh, when the parents uh, brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace, just as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all the peoples, a light of, for res, revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel." His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told 
his mother Mary. Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. This son of yours has a great work to do. Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you still speak. Thank you that we can gather like this and do our very best to be safe and considerate of others. Some of us are in the room, some of us are online, some of us will watch this days from now. But as we read your word this morning, uh, Lord, we're asking for a fresh word from you. Lord, we look forward to a new year, not because that the calendar, not because the calendar has changed, but because you have not. That you are a God that we can trust and that you always keep your promises and that Jesus has finished his work, his great work of redemption and has invited us to join in him. Lord, may you be glorified today as we uh, unpack your word here in in, uh, in public, uh, Lord, but may you do a work in our hearts uh, that is uh, powerful and transforming. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much. You may be seated. So, you know, waiting, I don't know if you feel this way or not, but waiting is heavy work, right? So if you're a kid uh, and you are waiting for Christmas morning, you know how, weight, how weighty waiting is. You know that there's some gifts under there. Those gifts are for you. You may have a suspicion of what they are. You may not, but waiting is heavy work. It's weighty work. And so Simeon had been waiting uh, because the Holy Spirit had promised him that he would not die, he would not see death until he saw the one who is life, Jesus himself, the Messiah. Um, now, he was a resident, Simeon was, of Jerusalem. At least he made his daily work in Jerusalem. Um, he saw the effects of Roman occupation. He saw that and felt that up close every day. Roman soldiers were doing patrol around the city. He saw Jewish leaders, religious leaders, politicizing their role in order to advance their own positions and protect what they had and would often compromise perhaps their principles in order to stay in good graces with Roman powers. He saw the hearts of people who had the greatest opportunity to know God and to experience God's favor. He saw their hearts grow cold to the things of God. Jerusalem, like many cities, was of a city that had gaps, gaps between the haves and the have-nots, uh, gaps between the powerful and the weak, gaps between the insider and the outsider. Uh, Simeon had to have walked past these injustices every day on the way to the temple. Perhaps he was also had experienced some of those injustices himself. He lived in a perilous time. He lived in a difficult moment. But Simeon was righteous, a devout man who listened to God, who walked with God. He was a man who did not allow the distractions around him and the waywardness that seemed to um, uh, define his own community to de detour his faith. The gospel accounts introduce us to a lot of uh, several people like this. And again, I'm a big fan of Zechariah, uh, John the Baptist's dad, um, Joseph and Mary, um, the shepherds that we took a look at on Christmas Eve. These were individuals who had an uncommon devotion uh, to God in a, in a moment and in an environment where, you know, not everybody 
was following God. While the world was passing him by, while so many around him were making different decisions about what they would do with the promises of God, Simeon held fast to these ancient words. Simeon um, held on to the promise of God. Even when it looked like there was no fulfillment happening, even when it looked like there was no end in sight, even when he had nothing except the Word of God, that was enough. I, um, I don't know if this is true, but it could be that at least in some cases or in some way uh, you've um, had some reasons to become cynical about what God is doing in your life or in your community or even in your church or your family. Maybe you have many reasons to, at least in your mind, to cave to the cultural pressures that would encourage you to choose your own path, to go your own way, to make your own decisions and find your own happiness. Maybe maybe you feel, particularly this year, that you have reason to abandon what God has said. That you feel like you just know better, that these ancient words are kind of out of date and the people around you that you kind of admire and that you look up to and that seem to be getting a lot of attention and seem to be uh, finding success in life, they don't really have a, a bent toward the things of God. And you're just not sure if all this is, is yours. Is, um, just not sure if this is your faith or not. I think back and as I was walking through this and thinking and imagining, trying to put myself in a Simeon's place, um, you know, he wasn't the first one to try to follow God in the dark. He wasn't the first one to try to stay faithful, you know, in times of difficulty. You remember Isaiah? You, remember, you'll, you may remember this passage. Isaiah 40 says this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Youths may even become faint and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, will renew their strength, and they will soar like on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint it's it's uh, almost every time Deborah and I are driving down I-40 going into Nashville and we come near the airport exit and we see these planes coming over us uh, Deborah's just amazed by it that something that heavy can stay like in the air right it's an amazing thing that a plane like that can catch the air in such a way as to keep it in flight. I think of that when I read this. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. Simeon would echo Isaiah and say, Jesus, dear friend, is worth the wait. It, he may not he may not show up in the timing that you expected, but God is true to his word. He would say, be faithful, dear fellow saints, even when you're tired, even when you feel passed over, even when you feel like you can't take any more, even when no one else is waiting with you, so it seems. God keeps his promise. Someone once said, I'm sure if I'd uh, researched a little bit harder, I could have figured out exactly where it started. But someone has said, what God has shown you in the light, trust him with it in the darkness. 
See, God calls him to us, he calls us to himself in the wait. Because it's in the wait that we discover who he is. It's in the difficulty that we discover who he is. I heard uh, Governor Lee say it again this week. I've heard him say this on a number of occasions. I'm sure it's formative in his life, and we kind of repeat the things that mean something to us. And I I heard him say it again this week. He said, you know, it 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 was the difficult losses of my life that God used to transform me. And he speaks um, quite openly about losing his, his wife, his first wife, to death. And the things that, the things that sh- uh, cloud our hearts and put a shroud over our eyes and put us in the most difficult moment is the often the thing that God uses the most to shape our character and transform our lives into the likeness of Jesus. It's in the weight that we discover that Jesus really is enough. So if you take notes or following along, Jesus is worthy of the weight. That's the first statement I'd make. Look in verse 27, he says, guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple Uh, When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, uh, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God and said, Now, Master, speaking to the Lord, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. I have put my eyes on the one you have sent to redeem us. I want you to notice all the things, all the very things, personal things that we know about Simeon. I don't know how many people know this kind of detail about your life, but notice, notice what we see. We see first that he was a man who was guided by the Spirit. Now, it's not that the Holy Spirit took him by the hand that morning and walked him into the temple, gave him flashing you know, lights or you know, a, a, a red carpet you know, kind of entrance. It wasn't that. It was that he was a man who knew God. God and walked in step with the Holy Spirit. His fellowship with God, listen, his fellowship with God, his intimacy with the Almighty put him in the right place at the right time. He walked in step with the Holy Spirit. And because he was a man who listened to God and walked with God intimately, he was a man who was put in a position to experience the promise of God. A lot of us want the promise of God. A lot of us want the success that God would, would, would have the power to give us. But we always find ourselves kind of out of position. And I'll avoid using you know, a sports analogy to make that point, all right? But when you're out of position, you miss your opportunity. We also see Simeon take the baby Jesus in his arms and praise God. We see him captivated by the presence of Jesus and worship him. He didn't wait for a worship service to be organized and called together. He simply worshiped just as the shepherds did in the fields, later wise men did at the feet of Jesus. In the presence of Jesus, Simeon worshiped. We then read that he was content. He said, now you can take me. I am satisfied. It's okay. I'm I'm done here. I'm I'm done here. I have, you have, you have fulfilled every longing of my heart. Isn't that great? You fulfilled every longing of my heart. Again, here's another cliche. But uh, when it's jostled, whatever's in the bucket, you know, comes out right? Uh, This year, we've all been jostled a little bit. It's been a jostling year, you know? We've been shaken up. And what has come out among even the people of God hasn't always been too pretty. I've had a few moments where I've been jostled this year, and I didn't really, 
I wouldn't want to repeat that moment. You know, I wasn't really proud of what, what came out. Anxiety and anger, you know, are friends. And uh, they thrive on one another. They ping off of one another. They get along really well, anger and anxiety do. And the disruptions in our lives and the uncertainty that we've experienced and the vulnerabilities that we've felt have exposed our hearts and um, covered us in fear a lot more than they've revealed our faith in some cases. Anger more than love. Chaos more than contentment. When we're not walking by faith... um, We grow haughty faster than we grow humble. We're quicker to judge other people. We're quicker to condemn people who might think differently than we do. We're quicker to assume the worst about people. And all the while just going through life with such little joy. Um, Our worship wanes. I've... uh, Notice, just as a pastor, how um, the difficulties that we've experienced has has led some people to respond in great faith, and they are more on fire for Jesus than ever before. But I've noticed that other people who who carry a Bible, who know the rhythms and routines of church life, for example, who've been a Christian for a long time, they seem to have grown cold and lukewarm, at least to the things of God, to the people of God, to the mission of God. They found uh, in this this, um, irregular time opportunities to bail out on one another and on the mission of God. Simeon, though, reminds us of what the presence of Jesus actually looks like. We see in Simeon a man who personally embodies the presence of God. And out of this difficult situation that he was in and ushered into this moment where he was able to meet Jesus and see the one who had been promised to him, we see the fruit of the Spirit in his life. Uh, Paul tells us what that looks like. He says the fruit of the Spirit is Love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against these things. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That idea is that I have put to death, as Cooper illustrated for us earlier, I have put to death the things of the flesh. I have crucified the flesh with its passions and I continue to crucify them daily. If I live by the Spirit, Paul goes on to say, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So this internal work that Jesus does in us, that the Spirit of God literally does within us, is a very personal work that leads to a very public result. That what's on the inside is pressed to the outside. What God does in us on a personal level affects the way that we love the people around us. So changing the calendar, it it won't change your life. I know this week you may make some New Year's resolutions, and I'm I'm for that. I we all need to kind of reevaluate where we spend our time, money, energy, all those things. The year 2021 will not give you a fresh start. A new job, a new set of clothes. A, new group of friends, a new house or car, a new gym membership. Those are all graces of God and and they all have their place and they all should be like celebrated. But they will not give you peace. Fresh starts begin with Jesus. Simeon knew this and he discovered 
that living by the Spirit means walking in step with the Spirit. The greatest need of the moment is not a new calendar or a new day planner or whatever it is. The need of the moment is is not for you to accomplish all your goals and to be the success that you've dreamed of being. Those are all important things. We all have dreams and aspirations. I have a few dreams and aspirations for the new year. But the greatest need of this moment are men and women who walk with God, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who disciple other people to follow Jesus with them. We, you and me, and you listening to me this morning, we have everything we need except the manifest presence of God in our lives, our homes, our marriages, our parenting, our churches, our community. We lack nothing, absolutely nothing except an insatiable hunger for God. While the nations rage and pundits throw verbal grenades into the room and religious elites jockey for position and power, Dear God, give me a city filled with simians, men and women who know God's voice, who walk with him, who trust his hand, simians who know by personal experience that Jesus is the satisfaction of our souls. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good place for that. We were talking about that the other day. Sometimes you're not sure, but that was a good place for an amen. Jesus is enough. I know I posted it sometime in the last day or two, but I just know a lot of young couples, more and more, who are upwardly mobile, who are an absolute wreck. They have more money they know what to do with, more time off than they can take. Their kids have all the cool stuff. Nothing wrong. I like, I'm glad. I'm so glad people have things. They're so active and so energetic about so many cool stuff, things. They got their kids in ball. I mean, good night. Their kids. I mean, Mickey Mantle would have loved to have had the gear that these kids have. Parents have so much energy, creativity. It's amazing. They just have no passion for God. No interest, no real interest in walking with Jesus. They've measured their lives by the accomplishments of others, which you can only, you know, measure to a certain extent. You don't really know me. I don't know you. You know a few things that I'll post. You know what you can see. But to measure your life against mine or anyone else's is a futile, futile thing to do but if they're measuring they're they're really ahead but we don't know God's voice we have a waning hunger for him and if Jesus showed up we wouldn't recognize him Simeon was a man who waited on God and until God came through, he walked in the spirit of the living God so that when God came through, he saw him. and He worshipped him. And he was forever changed. Jesus is enough to satisfy your soul. All right. Verse 31 says, you have prepared Here's what this is. This is Simeon's testimony. He says, You've prepared it in the presence of all the people. And then he, he says this. He says, you know, before he says, Listen, I'm content. I, I can die in peace now, but, but, 
that's not all. My satisfaction is not the end of the story. My contentment is not all that God is doing. My salvation is not all that is going on here. There's something bigger, y'all. That's what he said, y'all. He said it like that. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what he had said. And Simeon blessed them and told Mary, listen, it's not this that you don't know. You, you've just not, you, you've not heard the half of it, I don't think. This child will cause the fall and rise of many. A sign that will be opposed. A sword will pierce your own soul, Mary. The thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. This son of yours. This promise who is promised and given so much contentment of heart he is doing a incredible work among all kinds of people you see Simeon knew that the Messiah who was promised to the Jews was not only for the Jews while so much of his personal culture was surrounded by the trappings of Judaism which is understandable He knew the Lord well enough to know that his promise was for all peoples, Jews and Gentiles alike, and that the Jews would have the privilege of introducing the world to its Savior, its Redeemer, Jesus of Nazareth, King of kings and Lord of lords. But this privilege would would not be received by everyone in Israel, right? We know that. And Mary would experience unimaginable grief and heartache as she watched her son come into his own and his own not receive him. It's interesting that as much as he loved the Jews, he loved his people, Simeon did. His allegiance was not to them, but to the glory of God and the light of, to the Gentiles. His satisfaction in Jesus shaped his ambitions and loyalties. Rather than being just for himself or just for his people, just for what he could, you know, get out of God, he understood that God had the nations on his mind when he sent Jesus. I was reading this morning in my own devotional time from John chapter 6, and uh, Jesus had just fed the 5,000, remember, and then he had sent them away and the the disciples got in the boat to head to Capernaum, and, and uh, of course, they noticed that Jesus didn't get in the boat with them. But then the next day, Jesus is like with the disciples because during the middle of the night, he joined them on the boat, you know, during the storm. And so they, they find him in Capernaum and said, Hey, what's going on? And, and Jesus said, Listen, you're not chasing me because of who I am, you're chasing me. Uh, because I make some good bread. <laughs> you, you like the way I cook. That's why you're chasing me. You're not trying to track me down for my own sake or for my glory or the glory of God and what I've come to accomplish. You, you just are wanting another, you know, meal in the desert. You're just wanting what I can give for you. Simeon. So this isn't about me and my people. This is about the nations. You see, the exclusivity of Christ for salvation kills every, I mean, destroys every exclusive elitist bone in our body. The exclusive nature of salvation in Jesus does not lead us to hold him and keep him to ourselves and make sure that he's padding our pockets and that he's putting food in our pantries. No, 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 no. The exclusive nature of Jesus destroys every elitist motive of our life. You cannot be all about Jesus and all about yourself. You cannot be open to the gospel and closed to the world. When Jesus is your satisfaction, your contentment, my contentment, 
His mission of making the glory of God and salvation in Christ known to the world is our ambition. So let's just take a moment, all right? You'll follow me with this, I think. It's easy. It'll be easy for you to track with me what we're doing here. So why don't you just think for a moment before you make your New Year's goals. And again, I am not dissing New Year's resolutions or New Year's goals. I think it's helpful to reset. I think the changing calendar is a helpful reset for us. So you don't hear me, you know, poo-pooing on New Year's resolutions. But what, what would happen instead of us beginning with what we want to accomplish and the weight we want to lose and the stuff we want to do and the, you know, money we want to make and all that kind of stuff. What if instead of beginning with us, what would happen if we began with other people? What if we began with other folks? What, if, what would happen if we began thinking about the new year with the lostness of our neighbors in uh, the front row of our thinking? What would happen to our goals if we began thinking of the least of these among us, the hungry, the helpless, the hopeless? What if we began there? What if that was the driver? What would happen if we began as students of other people? I I remember uh, just this week I heard Miles McPherson, pastor in San Diego, uh, speaking, and I can't quote him exactly, but he was talking about how much we think of ourselves, like you know, we wake up and we look in the mirror and we see ourselves. We have self-thought all the time. We're talking to ourselves. We're reviewing conversations in our mind all the time. We're evaluating ourselves all the time. How do we, how do, we do over here? How, you know, what, what are we going to do? And all that, all that kind of stuff. And yet we would, we would admit that we still don't know ourselves super well. But yet we walk into a room and rather than being student of the people that are in the room, we assume we know them. We, we assume that we know what everybody needs. We assume that we know what everybody expects. We assume that we know what would be best for the people around us. What if, what if instead of beginning the new year uh, with ourselves in full view, what, if, what would happen if we became students of other people and we walked into our place of business uh, into the new year and we asked some questions? What, what, is, what is your greatest need this year? What is the aim of your life? What are the goals that you didn't meet last year that have frustrated you? What if we begin by asking some questions of the people around us? What would happen if our first concern was about the nations? You know, people who are not Americans, for example. People who are uh, either uh, immigrants uh, here in, in our own land or that are in a faraway place. What if, what if our aim... Uh, focused on those people. How would our lives change if we shared God's ambition to make Jesus known among people who have never heard the gospel? Let me, let me ask you this question. I'm almost uh, finished, but what would happen to our parenting if our kids knew that they weren't the center of your universe? I'm not saying they're going to feel like you don't love them or anything like that, but what, what if the aim of your family's life was other people. So Daryl, that was a pretty long paragraph there, a lot of run-on sentences. Um, that's a lot. I understand that. We, we can't do everything. You can't do everything. And I want to just free you up. You're not me. I'm not you. You're not the people around you. You're not online. You're not the people next door. You're you. And God doesn't tell you or me to do everything. I can't do everything. That's why there's so many of us. <laughs> That's why there's so many of us. Because one of us can't do everything. But when his people pursue our calling, transformation takes place. Transformation erupts around us. Transformation begins to take place in our homes. Transformation begins to take place in our place of business, on the ball field. Transformation begins to take place in our city, 
for one person. For some of you, it's serving um, hungry meal, uh, hungry people some food, giving them some meals. For others, it's starting, uh, helping us start a church in Nashville. Or uh, some of you coach soccer at the high school or teach in the schools next door. Or some of us uh, write stuff. Some of us um, give money. Some of us volunteer our time at the senior center. We all can't do everything. And that's why there's so many of us. When all of us pursue God's calling on our lives, gospel transformation erupts. Spiritual awakening begins. And people come to Christ. For all of us, it's about rearranging our lives to show and tell the gospel to whoever's in reach of us, and sometimes to those who are just outside of reach to us. Sometimes we have to make new decisions about what we're going to do with our time, uh, energy, talents, money, all of those things. Sometimes we've got to say, you know, I'm not going to give myself to this in the same way. You know, I'm going to rearrange my life and my priorities. I, I've been so much about me. Today, I'm going to be about the glory of God among the nations. For that, for that to happen, we have to adopt a new attitude. And uh, Paul said it this way. I want you to have this mind in you, this attitude in you which is also in Christ Jesus. And he began to, I'm sure he sung the hymn at some point along the way, but he wrote it in Philippians chapter 2. It tells us how Jesus emptied himself. It's called the kenosis passage. I refer to it a lot. The self-emptying of Jesus where he put aside all the rights and privileges that were due to him. He set those aside and made himself a servant to all. Simeon discovered the gospel, and he discovered in Jesus that Jesus was the hope for all the world. What would happen we rearranged our lives in that way what would happen if God rose up raised up a army of simians like that one of our favorite hymns you know at Christmas is joy to the world one of the stanzas goes like this and I'll pray and I'll be done no more let sins and sorrows grow nor thorns infest the ground he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found far as the curse is found. There is no place too dark for the good news of the gospel and the light and the glory of God. As far as the curse is found, his blessings will flow. Hey, would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? If you're online, I just invite you to bow your heads right here. I'm closing this thing down. We've got a few other things to do before we finish. But uh, let me just invite you to just do a little bit of self-examination. This is one of the reasons we come together on a Sunday in order for us to be reminded of some things. Our hearts are prone to wander. And uh, so in a moment like this, it's a, a really important time to just return to the Lord and, and just do some, some personal examination. Uh, we've all been jostled a bit, and we could all identify some moments this year that have not been our greatest moments. Like, I'm not really sure I want a year in review, you know, video montage this year. We've had some moments that haven't been too good, but we've also had some moments, many, I think more than the bad ones, of where God has been gracious. And to be honest with you, it sounds simple and it sounds um, simplistic maybe is a better word. 
But I believe that every Sunday, when the people of God gather, something incredibly gracious takes place. It's been a little more difficult this year, but we can gather and we look across the room and we see friends singing to Jesus. Their Bible's open, listening to the Word of God, and we are surrounded by people who are strugglers with us who find their hope in Jesus as well. There's been some tough moments, but there's been some faithful moments and gracious moments from God. But I just wonder, as um, we finish this year, if the Lord would have a fresh calling on your life for you to maybe agree with him that um, your heart has wandered away. And he says um, in Acts uh, 3, I think, uh, repent therefore and return to the Lord that times of refreshing may come from his presence. Maybe that's our need today. As we end this year and begin for a new one, how we need His presence. Do you know Him personally today? I mean, is He your Savior and Lord? Simeon saw Him and was satisfied in Him. Salvation had come. You have a testimony like that? If not, you can. It's with the heart we believe. It's with the mouth we confess Jesus is Lord. Would you trust him today as the Lord of your life? Like Cooper, would you go public with your faith? Say, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. I trust him for my life, my all. Maybe that's the decision you need to make. And if so, there's a connect card online. You can let us know by emailing us or filling out that connect card at greenhillchurch.com. It could be that you're in the room and it's just the moment you need to respond to the gospel and be saved. In just a moment when we finish, we'll be, our pastors will be here at the front and we'll linger around for a moment. We won't put any pressure on you, but if you want to talk to us, we'd love the privilege of walking with you as you take the next step with Jesus. We're going to prepare for communion, so let me pray. Lord, how we thank you that from the beginning of this hour till now, we have said over and over and over that Jesus is enough, because he is. Your word, all of it from Genesis to Revelation, points us to our Savior, King Jesus. All of it is a plea to lay down self-determination, self-fulfillment, self-rule, and trust Jesus, the only one who can move us from death to life. We bless your holy name. We thank you that fresh starts don't begin just in a at the turning of a calendar, fresh starts begin at the feet of Jesus. So we turn our hearts to you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as a response, we want to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You should have gotten a packet as you came in. If you don't have one, there should be some out. In, well, there are some out in the foyer. So does everybody have one of these? All right. If you don't, you can go grab you one. We want you to participate. So the top piece of plastic comes off, and there's a piece of bread there. We observe communion for a number of reasons. One, as I've already alluded to, uh, it's a time of self-examination. Um, it's a time for you. This is an invitation to come to the table for all who are in Christ and so it's a time to examine yourself, to confess your sins before the Lord, to commit to make them right if you made wrongs with others. Um, it's a time to uh, worship. 
It's a time to proclaim the Lord's death until he returns again. Somebody has said this recently, but so much of the Christian faith is wrapped up in waiting. Simeon and others were waiting for his first coming. We continue to wait for his second coming. And until then, we make much of him. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. It was, a much, it was an intimate setting in an upper room, but he broke that bread and he distributed it among his disciples. And he said, I want you to take this and, and eat it. This bread is my body which is broken for you. When you eat it, would you remember me? And again, in the same way, in much the same way, and the setting that we have is different. Uh, the elements that we have are a little bit different. Um, but I just imagine Jesus, and we know that he was leaning on cushions and it was an intimate setting with his disciples. And in just a few minutes, he would be sweating drops of blood, asking the Father if there was a different way. And, but ultimately saying not my will but yours be done so he he knew what was upon him so he took this cup and he said this cup is the blood of the new covenant given for you as often as you drink it remember me I want you to know that it was in that moment that would be the most difficult moment the disciples would ever experience. And he knew that remembering would be important. Some of you are in the thick of it right now. It's a difficult time. And you need to remember that Jesus is enough. I'm going to pray and then Casey will come. We'll be finished soon. Father, thank you that you've given us the ability to, to read your word and to look back on what was done on our behalf. You made history. And uh, in making history, you secured our future. You moved us from death to life and you gave us um, hope that is certain not in what we can accomplish but in what Jesus has done and so we bless his holy name and we do begin a new year with a certain hope that Jesus is enough pray all this in his name If uh, you want to continue the conversation uh, this morning, if uh, pastors will be down front uh, after the service, and we would uh, love to be able to uh, talk with you about how you can begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're online this morning and uh, something that Pastor Daryl said uh, spoke to you and you want to speak to a pastor, if you'll just put it in the comments there, uh, one of us will reach out to you this week and we can continue that conversation about how you can have a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, just a couple things that you need to know uh, about these coming days. Next Sunday, we will be on this exact same schedule. There'll be no life groups next week. We'll be on the same schedule, one service, everyone together at uh, 1030. We still will have children's programming from birth through fifth grade, but we'll be on the same schedule starting a new sermon series out of Psalms of 15, uh, 115. So if I was you this week, I'd go ahead and start uh, reading that. And we're going to be in that for the next three weeks, Psalms 115. Uh, two, two things I want you to mark your calendar for in January. Uh, January the 17th. January the 17th is when we're going to have our next Discover Green Hill class. If you're interested in knowing more about Green Hill and being a part of this, this uh, family, 
Um, that will be a class that you would like to uh, attend. You can either attend that in person or online, and you'll hear more about those opportunities in the coming days. That's also the same day that we're going to have our next, uh, next steps class for our uh, children's ministry and for our student ministry. So if there's any kids or students that have an interest in taking their next step with Jesus, whether that be salvation or baptism, we'll have a class for them on uh, the 17th. Also on the 31st is when we're going to have uh, parent and child uh, dedications. So if you're interested in being a part of uh, that on uh, the 31st, let us know in the church office. That's always a sweet time when we dedicate our uh, children and our parents um, uh, on uh, the 31st. We'll also, that will also be our family worship day and also our baptism Sunday. So if you have any interest in uh, baptism, whether uh, if you're a kid, you can talk with Miss Kathy, um, our, uh, our children's director. And if you're a student or an adult and you're interested in baptism, uh, you can speak with me about that and we will uh, help you take those next steps in uh, baptism. The last thing we'd like to say is uh, Happy New Year. And uh, also, end of the year giving. Any of the end of the year giving that you need to take care of between now and uh, the first, um, the uh, uh, online, you can uh, still give through our uh, greenhillchurch.com. Or uh, if you have any questions about that today, you can see Pastor Ricky if there's uh, a time this week that you need to stop by and drop off a check or anything like that. Um, uh, let uh, Pastor Ricky know. If not, I hope you guys have a great week. Happy New Year, and you are sent.